And so Paul writes a corrective letter. He's a little frustrated. He writes a letter of correction. That's what this Galatian book is, this letter. The Bible calls it epistles or books, but it's a letter to that church. He writes it in correction to this, to this different gospel is what he called it. Okay? So in the beginning, he starts off last week, he, we, we found out he started off, man, I'm so astonished that you are so quickly turning from the gospel that you had received, the one that I taught you, to a different gospel. So he, he starts to paint this beautiful or brilliant picture of these two different brands of Christianity, two different ways of following Jesus. And it shows up in, this, in, in the Genesis story in the Garden of Eden with the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And there's one way to follow God it, it, that is life-giving. It's the tree of life. It gives life. It's really birthed out of a relationship with God through Christ. And it's, it's, it's full of joy, peace, and life. And then there's this other way of following God that's based out of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which is not, which is not based out of a relationship, but out of rule following. So it's not based out of an internal desire, but out of an external duty. Like, I got to do this. I need to perform or please God. So there's these different gospels, and he's saying, look, you're buying into the wrong one. That's not, that's not what this gospel is supposed to be about. And so it's a corrective, a corrective letter. Um, man, if you missed last week's message, I would say you need to go listen to that. You really do. If you're part of Discovery, if you consider this your church and you miss that, you got, or if you're considering, like, should this be my church, that's a message I, that I think is a bedrock is the founda- it's a foundational teaching of the DNA of Discovery Church. You should go listen to that, um, watch that online on YouTube. I'm going to pick it up right where we left off. We finished Galatians chapter 1. I'm going to pick it up in Galatians chapter 2 today. So you can look up here on the screens or check it out in your notes. Let's pick it up in verse 11. It says, later, when Peter, and that's the apostle Peter, when he came to Antioch, Paul decided to go to Antioch as well and have a face-to-face confrontation with him because he was clearly, Peter was clearly out of line. Here's the situation, Paul says. Earlier, before certain persons came from James, Peter regularly ate with the non-Jews. So Peter would hang out with these Galatian Christians, these, these Gentiles, and he's having fellowship with them, and he's loving them, and he's not condemning them. He's just he's doing life with them. Look what happens next. But when that conservative group came from Jerusalem, the the Jewish Christians, he cautiously, and here's the words I want you to see. You may want to underline them. He cautiously, it says he pulled back. He pulled back. So so Peter was over here in this life-giving, full of Jesus, loved God, and then these guys came and he pulled back. And that's kind of the theme of today's message. I'll get into that in just a moment. He pulled back and put as much distance as he could manage between himself and, the, and his non-Jewish friends. So here he is. He's all befriending them. And then when these, this Jewish group came in, he acts like, no, I'm not really their friends. No, I don't know them. Who are they? And he's just kind of, he's acting like I don't know them and I'm not their friends. And watch what happens next here. It says, that's how fearful Peter was of those conservative Jewish clique that's been pushing the old system of circumcision. Unfortunately, the rest of the Jews in, in the Antioch church joined in too. So I want you to see this. All these people, these new Christians, these Gentiles, they got this new faith. This new, they, they heard the gospel of Jesus. They have this, this relationship. They're finding freedom, which is the theme of the whole book here, this joy where there's no rules. There's no rules. They're just following Jesus in freedom. It's out of a heartfelt desire. And then... They see Peter acting this way, and they go ahead and join right in and go back to this old other gospel. It says that hypocrisy, so that even, and Paul is just kind of dumbfounded, even that Barnabas, he says, even Barnabas was swept along in the charade. I want you to see this. The question of today's message today is, how do we keep from going back to our old way of living? How do we do it? How do we keep from... From, I mean, we've experienced this freedom, this grace, this, this love, this forgiveness. How do, how do we keep from going back now to that old gospel, that old religious mindset? How do we, how do we keep 
from going back from this freedom tree that gives life back to this religious tree. Because the truth is, you guys, it's a lot easier than you think. It's a lot easier than you think to, to, to go back, to switch back and forth. In fact, I'm convinced that there is a vine growing between the trees. And, and like Tarzan, we can swing from one end. Because you know, you, you're in the tree of life. You have good experiences with God. And you're in this life-giving relationship, just full of love and full of life. And then something happens, you swing right back into that. that I mean, I do it too. I'm telling you, we're all susceptible to this, to, to going back and forth, even myself. I feel like Tarzan, even sometimes, swinging back and forth to this life-giving, to then this, this other gospel that's, that is not out of an internal desire, but out of external duty. I'll tell you a story. I've told it before, but if some of you haven't, haven't heard it, it goes, it relates to what we're talking about today. There was, years ago, we had this great worship experience. It was a Sunday service. And not here, it was years ago, but, but even in the altar service, man, it was a powerful, like, like people came up, man, I, was, I gave a prophetic word, there was healing, it was just powerful. How I many you ever had a, just a powerful experience with God, and then you leave church, you're on cloud nine, right? You're just like, it feels great. I remember leaving this wonderful experience with God, I have worship on my radio, and, and, and it's shout to the Lord of the earth. How I many remember that song? I was shouting to the Lord, and I was singing on the way home just getting it man I was getting it and I and then I get on the 99 from airport and and then it all went south real quick there was this car who 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 just came up sped up on me on my bumper and almost touched me and I'm and I'm like what is this guy what is this guy doing you know and I'm and 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 I get over I'm thinking he's gonna pass me you know when I get into the slow lane on the 99 I get on 99 and he stays on my bumper and there's open lanes and 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 I'm like and I'm talking in the mirror, and I go, wait, what, what you, I, went, I went from shout to the Lord to shouting at this guy, and my, all of it gone, all of it gone. And, I, and you don't really shout, though, in the car. How I many you know what I'm talking about? You just lip the shout, right, in the rear view. I, I, don't lie. You be done. And you're just mouthing it to the rear view mirror. Like, I didn't do anything. What do you want? What are you doing? And then, and then I rolled down the window, and I'm like, come on, then. You know, just. Come on, jerk, you know? And, and I'm thinking, like, he comes over, and I'm thinking, I'm going to give this guy the stink eye. Like, what is your problem, dude? And I'm like, and, and he comes up, and it's one of the young adults that serves at our church. <laughs> and he's all, ha, 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 I got you. And he was messing with me. I'm telling you, I went, I went from this, honestly, I went from this tree of life. I was so full of God, had this great experience, and I grabbed hold of that vine, baby. And I swung right back over to this other, this other gospel. I mean, I, I, it's so quick. And I think there's this tendency in all of us just to swing from, from these, uh, the, 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 the life-giving following Jesus to this other way that does not bring life. It actually brings, it brings death. So how do we do that? How do we, what do you do? How do you keep from going back? How do you keep from going back and staying in this life-giving relationship with Jesus, it begins, it begins by understanding the gospel. And that's where, that's where Paul now, he takes the Galatian churches, he sees them swinging, buying into the wrong gospel, doing it out of rules and duty, and so what he goes next to, he just goes, now I need to re-explain. I need to re-explain the gospel to you guys, so let me re-explain. Let, let's, let's look at what Paul says next in Galatians chapter 2. He says, we know very well that we are not set right with God by rule keeping. That's not, you can't do it. We're not set right by God by rule keeping, but only through, I love this, a personal faith in Jesus Christ. That's the only way that you're made right. How do we know? He says we tried it, right? And every one of us have tried it. We've tried other things to make ourselves godly or to make ourselves right. And we had the best system, Paul says, of the rules the world has ever seen. And he's referring to the Ten Commandments right there specifically convinced that no human being can please God by self-improvement, we believe that Jesus as the Messiah so that we might be set right before God by trusting instead of doing. Internal instead of external. Not by trying to be good. Check this out. What actually took place is this, Paul says. I tried, to keep, I tried keeping rules and working my head off to please God and it didn't work. So I quit being a law man, that's the other tree, so that I could be 
God's man or God's woman. And that's what I want us to talk about today because I know the tension that exists between these two. And you have felt the tension. You know the, 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 that there is, there's these choices. And for most of us in this room, we've chosen the tree of life. Most of us serving God is a joy. It, it's, it, it's, a, it's a blessing, but there are those days. Where, where it feels like, you know, I, we just switch right back into the other way where, you know, I, I don't want to do it, but I don't want to go to hell, so I guess I should do it. That kind of mindset of it. Is there, is there a secret to staying in the tree of life, to staying in freedom? There is. I believe there is. And Paul actually shares with us this secret of, of staying in the tree of life. And I, it's the theme of this whole chapter. The final verse there in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 Paul reveals to us the secret of not being a law man, a religious man, or someone who's really not living out the life-giving gospel by a discipline, a practice that is not very popular. This, this is not a popular message I'm about to preach to you. Okay, let me say it this way. This is not a message that you would preach to grow the church, to, like, make it bigger. This is a message that you would preach if you want the people in your church to grow. Okay. I am convinced that if you can grab hold of this discipline that I'm going to share with you today, this, this art, then, then this has the power, second, second only to your decision to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that this has the power to change your life forever. If you can buy into what the apostle is about to share with us, this, this will change your life. If you can learn this, this art, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul reveals it to us. He says, I have been crucified. I've been crucified. I know Jesus died for me like he died on the cross, but I know in order to follow Jesus, in order to be a Christian, I need to put to death some things inside of me. Some things have to die. I've been crucified with Christ, and here's the principle. I no longer live. I don't live. What He's saying you got to learn the art of, of dying. You got to learn how to put to death some things. Because dead men don't get frustrated at traffic. Dead people don't get jealous. They don't, they don't judge other people. They're, they're dead. But Christ, he says, lives in me. The life I live in the body, I'm not letting my body call the shots. I'm not getting pushed around by, by my body. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is called living the crucified life and, and to die to self. And nobody right there was like, amen, pastor. Woo, that's good. No, no, we don't like this, right? This is, not, this is not a popular message, one that we want to just, you know, put to death some things that need to be dead. Amen, Pastor Jason, preach that. No. Are you serious, Jesus? Like, are you serious, Jesus? Die? You want me to die? You, you, you want me, that's what you want? Yeah. Yes, because this is a principle that's all throughout the scriptures if you want to come to this place of freedom. If you want to be truly free, living your life not according to what the world wants you to live, not according to what your desires are telling you to live, but you truly becoming God's man, God's woman. This is it. It can change your life forever. Jesus talked about this in the book of Matthew chapter 16. It says, from that time, and he's talking about the end of his earthly ministry, Jesus says, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed, and on the third day, be raised to life. Let me explain that real quick to you. So the disciples, they thought that Jesus was going to be an earthly king. They had no idea that Jesus was going to be a heavenly king. They thought he was going to be an earthly king. The Messiah was going to come because they were under Roman oppression, Roman rule. So they thought, man, here's Jesus. He's the Messiah. He's doing all these miracles. He's got the power. If anyone's going to do this, it's him. So they thought Jesus was actually going to sit on the throne in Jerusalem, overthrow Roman oppression, and be an earthly king. And, and they're frustrated now. So Jesus, he thinks, they're thinking he's the man. And now Jesus says, no, I'm, I'm, no that's not going to happen. I'm going to die. I'm, I'm going to be crucified, and which interrupted their plans, by the way. They thought they were, they were riding his coattails all the way to the, to the palace. 
right? And, which, by the way, this is one of the ways that you, you can discover, you can find out if you're in the wrong tree, is by how you react when things don't go the way you thought they would go. When you get offended, when you, when, when, when you get an interruption to your plans and the way you act, when you, get, when you get frustrated at that, you can tell really quickly that you're in the wrong tree. And then, and then side note here, these frustrated people will always have a certain knowledge. Okay, these, these people in the religious tree, they will always have this certain knowledge or this wisdom or this form of godliness that, that they explain away why they can condemn you, why they can judge you, why you're wrong, why, why they're acting the way they're acting because they're in the wrong tree. They're in the wrong tree. You can tell really quickly. Okay, that's just a side note. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, which is so hilarious. I just find that hilarious that here is Peter. This is, this is Jesus, Peter. You've seen him do all those miracles, loaves and fishes, multiplied stuff. This is Jesus. He can turn you into a grease spot. Really, Peter? You're going you're gonna to challenge, challenge Jesus. And so Peter just, he's frustrated here, and he says, never, Lord. This shall never happen to you. And Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. He literally rebuked the enemy that was working in his life at that moment. And he says, you're a stumbling block to me because you don't have in mind the things of God. You don't have God things in your mind. You have in your mind the things of men. You're thinking too much of yourself, Peter. There's too much of you alive. You're alive. You're too alive, Peter. There's too much of you going on in this thing. And then... Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone, watch this, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And Jesus introduces this concept of the people who live their life to the full are the ones who aren't living by their own desires, by their own passions, that in order to truly have a full life, you have to lose it. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will find it. And I want you to hear that today. I want to convince you today that if you understand and follow this art, this discipline of living a crucified life, that you regularly put to death some things inside of our lives, that the end result is, is this tree <laughs> that you'll be in that is full of life. The end result will be freedom you'll be free if I had started out that day putting to death some things um, then there's nothing that the 99 freeway would have been able to throw at throw at me nothing it wouldn't it wouldn't if I would have just put to death some things but what was only revealed was that Jason was too alive there was too much of Jason there was too much flesh there was too much of me alive still that needed to be put to death so so how do we do that? How do we keep from swinging back, going back to a religious man, to a, to a God man, to a law man? How do we, how do we prevent ourselves from going back? Uh, a lot of people, they don't want to hear this kind of message. You'd rather hear a message, how do, I, how do we change the freeway? You know what I'm saying? How do, we, how do we change other stuff? Don't talk about me, you know, because here, write this down. This is a side note. We want change situations, but God wants to change us. We want, we want the situation to change when God is actually looking to change us. And I want to submit to you today that I know you're in tough situations. We all, I, I know. Some of you are maybe in a tough marriage. Maybe you're in a tough job. Maybe you're in a tough season, tough financial uh, place. Maybe, you're, maybe you drive on a tough road to go to work and understand those things. And with everything inside of me, I also pray oftentimes for my situations to change. But at the end of the day, if you really want to find life, if you want to find life, it'll, you'll never find life because of a situation changed. Because even when the situation is changed, and it does change, you're still there. It's still you. The only way you truly can find life, see, the situation doesn't need to change. It doesn't. Whether it changes or not is regardless what needs to change is me. I need to change. And in order for me to change, something has to die. Something has to be put to death is a biblical principle all throughout your scripture. Um, let me show it to you in Romans chapter 6. Here's another place. Paul's talking about the crucified life. For we know that our old self needs to be and has been and was crucified with him so that by the body of sin might be done 
away with. So my impatience, done away with. My, my anger, done away with. Check it out. That we should no longer be slaves to it, which is where you end up when you're in the wrong tree. You become a slave to things. Because anyone who has lived, anyone who has died has been free. Anyone, anyone who has been, anyone who has died is free. That's, that's, the, you want freedom? You want life? That's the paradox. We need to, we need to learn the art of dying well, living the crucified life. And it's one that the Apostle Paul learned. And he, com he confronted Peter with this. He said, Peter, that's not, man, Peter, that's not right. That's wrong. You're over here in this tree and you're swinging over being a religious man. And Peter, that's wrong. You need to put to death some things. And, and it worked. But Peter caught it, by the way. You can see in Peter's life, when he writes First and Second Peter, that's a different Peter, a different attitude entirely. You go read that. Go read First and Second Peter. That's a totally different Peter, totally different attitude than the one that we're seeing right here confronted by, by Paul. I'm telling you, this will, this will, this concept, this principle has the power to change your life. Now, I've been reading Galatians over and over and over again, studying for this series. And what I did, and I actually done this, you know, months ago, I, I read through the book of Galatians and I looked at all the places that Paul says and he mentions the word crucify. So what I want, what I want to give you today is, is, to, is to give you the three places in the book of Galatians that Paul tells us to crucify. But check it out. There are, there are three different things that Paul tells us to crucify. In order to live a crucified life and to find this freedom and to stay in the tree of life and never go back to that religious man or go back to those old habits or those old lifestyles, Paul says you need to crucify three different things in your life. You need to put to death these three things. And I want to, let me share those with you today. Here's the first thing. We already, we already said it, actually. I already read the scripture where Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. I no longer live. Write it down this way if you're taking notes. And that is, number one, crucify self. Crucify self. Meaning, you might want to write, what that just means, self, it just means your life. You may want to write that down, your life. It just means crucify your life. We literally come to a place where you say, Lord, I not only give you my life at my salvation moment, but in a lot of, you remember your salvation moment. Remember that? Remember how, how awesome that was and how free that was? Do you remember that where you said, Jesus, you take the wheel. You're in control. I'm no longer in control. I don't want to go my direction anymore. You take over, God. You take, wasn't that a, a beautiful moment? Well, what would happen if you gave Jesus your life every day? Like you said that prayer every day. Some of you say, well, no, I already gave Pastor, I already gave this. I'm already here. I got this one. What's point number two, Pastor? I've already, I've already given Jesus my life. No, 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 no. You need to give him your life every day. Here it is, the principle, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 31. Paul says, I die every day. Say it with me. I die every day. Every day. Paul knew, he understood that there's this tendency for us to grab hold of that vine, for us to be in life, and to swing right back over to this old man, this old religious mindset, old lifestyles. And, in, and the secret was, in order to stay in freedom, in order to stay in this relationship, life-giving relationship with God, is I need to come to a place of salvation every day. I need to give my life again. I need to wake up and go, God, I give you my life today. Today, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come, come against challenges and difficulties, and I'm going to choose right now. I'm going to choose peace. I'm going to choose love. I give you my life. Thank you for forgiving me, God. I'm telling you, you do that every day. Your day will change. Your day will change. Now, let me say it this way. Your day not, may not change. You're going to come against the same things, but you'll be changed. And the way that you face those things will change. See, again, you want to change situations. God's want, God wants to change you. So we need to crucify self. God, take, take, take all of me again. God, I kill my attitude. I kill my attitude. I kill my, God, help me to be thankful instead of, instead of always, always being bitter and, and complaining. Help me to be thankful for what I do have. I'm telling you, if you started off crucifying yourself and giving Jesus your life every day, it'll change your day. It'll change it. And it, it seems that that prayer is only good for 24 hours. 
It just does, okay? That's, all, that's a 24-hour prayer. It's like a, it, it needs to, you, need, you need to come around because you miss it the next day, and here you are. There you are again, okay? There's this tendency of, our, of the human heart to keep swinging back and forth. If you want to prevent yourself from going back again, from going back to either the religious man or those old habits and patterns, you need to die. You need to give Jesus your life every day. I've been praying this prayer since we started playing, planning uh, Discovery Church four years ago. I've been praying this scripture as my prayer. John chapter 3, verse 30 says, He must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. One translation says, He must increase, and I must decrease. Man, I don't want to be, I don't want to be great, God. I want you to be great in my life. I don't need to be great, God. You, you, I just want you to shine and be great in my life. I want you to become less and you to be more. The, so what's the action step? Every one of these crucified that, that Paul says, I want to give you an action step to where you can actually live this out. You can, you can apply this today. Here's your action step. Write it down this way. This word, humility. Humility. You wouldn't think that this word would give you life, but there are a few words that will give you more life than this word, humility. I crucify myself, not my will, but your will, my life. Here's the second one that Paul mentions in the book of Galatians. The second thing we need to crucify, write it down this way, is to crucify my flesh. Crucify my flesh. And I wrote it that way purposefully because that's what the Bible, the, the scriptures actually say flesh, and he's not meaning your skin, like you need to actually rip your skin or something like that. Your flesh means, you should write this down as a side note, your flesh means your passions and desires. Your passions and desires. Look at this verse in chapter 5, the second time crucify is mentioned in Galatians 5, 24. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. What does that mean? That means that all of us have passions and desires that unfortunately the world is telling you you can trust those things. Oh, you feel that? That's okay. That's, that's part of you. It's the new theology of today. You can trust your passions and desires. Oh, that's just who you are. That's just who you are. You feel that? You have a passion for that? That's just, that's just who you are. Oh, that's not your anger. That's just the Irish in you. That ain't the Irish in you, man. That's the devil in you. That's the flesh in you, okay? That's something that needs to be put to death inside of you. Oh, you know what, my, just my dad drank alcohol, my grand, everyone drinks my I'm just, no, no, it doesn't need to be that way. You don't need to accept your feelings and your desires as your predispositions and your, you don't need to, as your orientation. And that's what the world is telling you now. Oh, that's just who you are, just go with it. That's just your orientation. No, I don't live by my feelings. My goodness, I'm telling you, I would not be a pastor today if I lived by my feelings. Because I have some jacked up feelings sometimes. I got some feelings that need to die. Sometimes I get some feelings, some passions and desires that I need to crucify. Because I don't live by my feelings. I live by faith. I don't let my feelings dictate what I'm doing. I let the word of God dictate my life. My faith. The word. I put to death my desires and passions. And that's not a one-time decision either. That is a daily decision that we need to I have to make the decision every day because the devil is going to make sure that you come up face to face with your passions and your desires and the temptation that is going to try to trip you up and in that moment you have a choice to make can I tell you to live by choice and not by feelings to live by choice to live by principle not by pressure that's what Peter was doing Peter lived by pressure he allowed people to pressure him peer pressure into into living and acting a different way than he knew was right. Well, Jason, that's hard. Yeah, but there's freedom on the other side of that choice. There's freedom. Because if you want to have life, you've got to lose it. And if you try, you try the other way, you're going to find out, and a lot of you already have found out, that that's death. It's death. The end, the end result of that is, is death. Joshua 24, 15. I love this word. He says, choose choose. Don't, don't wait for the feeling to come. No, no, no. Choose for yourselves this day who you will serve. Don't wait for the feeling. Make a choice. But as for me and my household, check this out. I love these two words. We will. See, it's not an act of my feeling. It's an act of my will, my conscious choice. 
Not my feeling. We will serve the Lord. Can I get an amen from somebody out there? So here's the action step, and that is make some good choices. Make some, make some good choices. The first thing I'm going to do to live a crucified life, I'm going to start off low. I'm going to live in humility, walk in humility. I need less of Jason driving around and more of Jesus. That's what I need. And then knowing every day I'm going to have to make a choice to follow ungodly passions or desires at that moment. I need to choose not my feelings, but I need to choose to live by faith. I'm going to do according to God's word. And here's the third place the word crucify is mentioned in the book of Galatians in chapter 6. Write it down this way. Paul talks about how we must crucify the world. Crucify the world. Let's read this verse, Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. It says, may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Check it out. Through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Well, what, does that, what does that mean? Paul is saying the secret to this life-giving freedom that I have is that I have a world filter. I, don't, I have a world filter, and every one of us, please hear this, every single one of us needs to have this exercise where we go through it, some things in life and we say, I, I can't hear that, I'm not going to do that, I'm not going to be a part of that, I'm not going to listen to that, I'm not going to watch that, I'm not going to let that come in here. I, need, I, I just got to have a filter, some things that I'm not going to let come inside of my life, and I'm not going to be a part of that worldly life. And I'm afraid that too many of us are letting the world affect us. And Paul says, nope. That world has been crucified to me. I, I, I am crucified to the world. And I'm just, I'm telling you, you need to, let me, let me tell you very plainly, you're, you're not going to be a person that lives in God's freedom, that is walking in freedom, in this tree of life, if you're letting Kanye influence your decisions, okay? Or if you're letting Fifty Shades of Grey influence your marriage. Okay? You're not going to be God's man or God's woman if you don't got a world filter where you just say, not that. I'm not going to watch. I'm not going to listen. I'm not going to go over there. Even myself, listen, I need to have a, I need to have a world filter because there's some, every single one of us do. You need to have a filter. So you say, well, what is it? Where's the line? Where's the filter, Pastor? Tell me where I can go. Where can't I go? What can I do? What can't I do? What am I supposed to watch? What am I supposed to listen to? No, I'm not going to tell you that. You don't need me or your pastor telling you what to do or not to do. You have the Holy Spirit. You have your Bible. I don't need to come up here and tell you this. That's, that's the old tree. That's the rule following. That's that legalism. That's not, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you read your word, you follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, and you need to have some place where you say, not that. I have places because of the enemy knows what passions and desires I have. Then I say, I'm not going to listen to that. I can't watch that. I have a good friend who's a, an executive pastor in a church, a successful church, and it, just one of, the, uh, one of the, my lifelong friends. He's an accountability partner. I talk to him all the time. But he's, and he, he tells people openly, he, he doesn't go to the beaches because of all the bears. He can't because of all the bears. All those bare stomachs, bare legs, bare, bare chests, bare, 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 just people bare. They're, they're bare naked, you know what I'm saying, basically. I'm serious. Like, he's just like, I can't look at that. That's lingerie, basically. So he knows. He knows who he is. He says, he said, Jason, I just don't. I, go, I, I don't go to the beach. He lives in San Diego, okay? And he says, I haven't been to the beach in 25 years. I don't. I just, I, because he said, Jason, I just, I know me. And that's a line. That I, I, I'm, I'm dead to it. It can't come here. I can't go there. So I don't know what, where, where your world filter needs to be, but I'm telling you, you need to be. And I'm not here to impose rules on you that's not the real gospel that's not what you need though you do need to know who you are and who your enemy is and you do need to have a filter i do i know i can't go places or i can't smell certain things i'm like no i ain't going over there Nah, because i know me and i don't want to be in that place where i'll grab hold of that vine and tarzan it in the other direction crucify the world 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul talks about this principle here, verse 17 and 18. He says, therefore, 
Come out from them. And be separate. There's, there's some, you need some separation from that. I don't know what that is for you, but, he's, but God is speaking to us. There's, there's some things that need to be separated. Come out from that and be separated, says the Lord. Don't touch that thing. Don't touch that. Don't get close to that. And I'm going to receive you. I'm going to be your father, and you're going to be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So write it down, and then we'll pray. The action step is separation. Separation. Humility, choices, separation. You want to live the crucified life? You want to stay in freedom, in this relationship with Christ that you operate in just joy and freedom, not rules. You want to stay there? You need to crucify yourself. You need to crucify your life. Like, give him your life again and again and again and again and again. And you need to crucify your flesh, this carnality, these passions and, the, and these desires that we have. And then we need to draw a line somewhere against this world. And we need to, we need to be separate from some of those things. Let's bow our heads right there and close our eyes.